Good. Welcome, dear friends, to another episode of Of Simchus, our series of conversations on crises in Jewish history. I'm Dr. Jerry Fogel, and I'm delighted to invite you to join us here today at the National Library of Israel here in Jerusalem. As my grandmother always says, uh, in life you need just a little bit of luck. You have to be well-intentioned, put in a lot of work, a lot of effort, but a bit salamazel, a bit a bit salamazel, a little bit of luck uh, we do need uh, for things to come out roughly uh, all right. Um, and in Jewish history, there's been a lot of luck and there's been a lot of ill luck and bad luck, as, as I think is starting to become uh, obvious from our series of conversations about uh, the uh, various catastrophes and crises that characterize uh, Jewish history, that shaped Jewish history and Jewish culture and Jewish identity in uh, many ways. I think it's a particularly interesting crisis we will be discussing today in this uh, context. Famed Israeli philosopher and public intellectual uh, professor uh, Yeshayahu Leibovitz had a very famous saying in Hebrew, uh, Mashiach Yavo, which everybody remembers, it has very unique elocution, Mashiach Yavo, as in the Messiah will come. The Messiah is always supposed to be coming in the future. He should actually never uh, materialize in the present. It should always be an aspiration to be fulfilled. It's a, not a very lucky uh, occasion, it turns out, in Jewish history. Uh, there's no Bissel Mazel when the Messiah does actually arrive, uh, as he did in the 17th century uh, with uh, Shabtai Tzvi, uh, the mysterious, uh, enigmatic, fascinating figure uh, that we will be discussing today and the ensuing crisis when uh, large swathes of the Jewish population were swept after a messiah that turns out to have been a false messiah or maybe not. This uh, is what we want to discuss today uh, with Professor Avriel bar -Levav, which we are honored and proud and very uh, happy to uh, have with us here today. Uh, Avriel bar -Levav is a professor of Jewish history and Judaic studies at the Open University of Israel. His publications are about Jewish attitudes towards death, Jewish book history, magic, secularization, and personal writings. He is co-editor of the journal Zutot Perspectives on Jewish Culture, co-edited the volume Death in Jewish Life that was published in 2014, and recently published at the Open University of Israel Press, together with Proche Professor Moshe Idel, an introduction to Jewish mysticism uh, in four volumes. Uh, Professor Avriel bar -Levav, Shalom Rav. Shalom. Um, right, so let's go straight for the jugular here, and perhaps uh, let me ask you, Professor bar -Levav, uh, to describe, I guess, the cultural, uh, historical uh, environment within which uh, Shabtai Tzvi was born within which Shabtaiism arose. I will do it immediately, but maybe you will allow me to make a small correction. Please. For what you said, because you called Shabtai Tzvi a false messiah. And uh, that it was a common, it, uh, a common way to describe him, but now we think that this is something, there is something judgmental about it, and that's like, we know the truth, he was lying, he's not sincere. So I think what is better and what is more used now is a fallen messiah. He had sincere attempts to be a messiah. It's, it's not that he was lying or that he was trying to make a fraud. He, wa he wanted to be a messiah. I think he believed he's a messiah, his followers, his prophet, uh, Natan of Gaza believed he's a uh, messiah, and, uh, but it, it was found out that it's not true. But it's not, uh, so it's fo rather fallen than, f uh, than false. Uh, false. Or maybe if we're no. not going to be judgmental at all, uh, we could, he, he might still uh, come back. Or maybe it, we might be yes, too I judgmental even to say that he was fallen, maybe. Well, uh, saying that he will come back is also judgmental, <laughs> but in the, in the opposite direction. But, uh, Anyway, let, may, maybe I'll say a few words about the background to this uh, in interesting uh, figure, um, more or less in the middle of the 17th uh, century. At the end of the 15th century, we have the expulsion from Spain, which is a major um, event in uh, Jewish life because 
um, Jewish creativity and uh, in both Jewish creativity and Jewish uh, social life in Spain were quite uh, long and uh, and stable and rich and suddenly this broke out and Jews had to go to all around the world, especially to the Ottoman Empire and this it's difficult to move. We, we, we all know that uh, moving is not uh, easy, immigrating and especially when it's uh, compulsory and uh, you don't have uh, you don't have a choice. So this is uh, a kind of uh, crisis. Again, we can say what kind of crisis is it? Because if people move and if uh, cultural creativity continues and if people are settled in new places, it's uh, so it's not like everything is fallen or people stop uh, everything and become totally depressed and passive. It's something else. But anyway, this is the this is the, the be in the this is in the background. We have also instability in uh, Europe and the uh, upheavals of the Cossacks of the Russian in the middle of the 17th century, and Jews are suffering from uh, from the as the Polish and uh, Russian and the Swedish war and uh, all kind of uh, very unpleasant events. And the peak is uh, the um, 1648 uh, uh, ri riots of the, of the Cossacks. These are more uh, kind of uh, physical. On the spiritual level, we have also connected, m might be connected with the from the expulsion from Spain and might also be connected to what I want to say afterwards, is the more central presence of uh, Jewish mysticism, of Kabbalah, in the Jewish uh, cultural life. We have a century before the center in uh, Sfat with the legendary figure of uh, Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Holy Ari, Ramak, um, Yosef Karo, also, Shulchan Aruch also was uh, was there, and uh, had the connections and uh, Kabbalah influenced uh, influenced him. But I think, if I will, if I have to choose one import, the mo what is the most important uh, factor of the background is the invention of print, mm. um, and that's uh, for Christians around uh, 1450 for Jews and um, first dated book 1475 uh, and this really changed the world in many ways um, it enabled communication it enabled multiplication of bo of, of, b of reading material b both books and uh, pamphlets um, and uh, it caused the, the process of using the vernacular language and, become the, and they became cultural languages. And, uh, and then we have the building of a national identity of people who, who speak uh, the, same, uh, the same language. And one of the central um, novelties of uh, print, one of, the, one of the central influences is new layers of readers reading small books. Because generally speaking, very generally, manuscripts are expensive. And printed books who copy manuscripts, who use, who, who just uh, duplicate big manuscripts, they're also expensive. But we have, slowly, we have a process of manufacturing of small books, we can say for small people. And this totally changes the cultural, emotional picture of, of the masses. So just to make sure I understand you right, physically smaller books were cheaper and yep. more available to uh, uh, simple uh, people's uh, reading public that is not uh, from the uh, economic elites in yes. some kind of way. Yes, those supply, uh, as I said, uh, those supply material to a new kind of readership that was not in contact with the expensive manuscripts. And uh, they also reacted to uh, Shabtai Tzvi. Maybe we move from the background to Shabtai Tzvi himself, who was born in uh, Izmir 
in uh, 1626. He, he was uh, a, a, a spiritual uh, person, I think kind of moody, um, interesting. He had a beautiful voice, he sang. Uh, um, he, he was also learned, but he, he wasn't really, he wasn't really a, a star. And, but he, f he felt messianic uh, from uh, a young age. He felt messianic uh, aspirations, um, which did, wasn't treated very seriously. Because, okay, so, so he says what, what uh, um, you mentioned your grandmother. I can, I can mention the Yiddish saying, it all gets out. Yeah. But uh, so he said. But what, what would he have meant? Like, what would it mean for someone in the 17th century to have messianic aspirations? To feel that he will be king of the Jews, that he will redeem the Jews, uh, maybe that uh, everyone, also the um, Muslim and Christians, will uh, not only accept his regime, but uh, accept uh, Judaism. That's, uh, we, we have... Uh, and of course, that the, the world will be ruled in a much more pleasant and uh, positive way than uh, than than before. No one really took him uh, very seriously. And but there was one moment of change, and this this uh, change was when he went uh, to meet a person uh, more learned and. Uh, and, and that and younger than him, and that was uh, Natan of Gaza. Natan was born in uh, Jerusalem, the middle of the 17th uh, century. He grew up in uh, Gaza, and he also was he, he was a learned person, also considered to have spiritual uh, powers. And actually, uh, because of his uh, moodiness. Uh, Shabtai Tzvi also suffered and was also uh, asked to move sometimes from community to community. He wasn't well uh, well accepted. And he, he wanted to, he went to Natan of Gaza in order to get remedy and to find uh, maybe solace for his uh, soul. And this meeting really was very very dramatic. This meeting was in 1650, in 1665, sorry, 1665, because just before uh, Shabtai came to Natan, Natan had a vision of the coming Messiah. And when he met Shabtai, he recognized him as the one that was seen to him to be the Messiah. And instead of uh, calming the guy and saying, you know, you don't have to take it very seriously, he did exactly the opposite. He said, yes, you are the Messiah. Now is the messianic era. We will, uh, you, will, you will be the Messiah. And he was the prophet of the, of the Messiah. And this uh, combination was really blowing. Mm. And people were impressed. People heard about it, people, Jewish people accepted it and believed, believed in it. Maybe they wanted to, um, and because, but they, they, they believed that now there is, uh, Shabtai Tzvi is the Messiah and we have a messianic era. He also, he behaved, Shabtai started behaving like a messiah, he divided the world between um, different, ki different kings from, uh, from his family and uh, and from others, and uh, he changed the ritual, which is uh, uh, actually Jewish uh, religious life is built on uh, ritual even more than on theory. So he made uh, new rituals like festival, the festival, and when he when uh, in his birthday, which was supposed to be the ninth of Av which is the, the legendary date for the birth of the Messiah. And, uh, and he, he behaved 
as I said, he behaved like a messiah. People, many people were convinced and accepted. And the news, because of the new ways of uh, communication, of uh, broadsheets, of uh, of uh, text, news texts, and and of of uh, books, because of print, now it uh, spread this quickly. Is- all around uh, the Jewish world. This is what yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, Professor Barlevav. Uh, they meet, Nathan of Gaza meets um, Shabtai Tzvi in 1665, yeah. declares him to be the Messiah that had been presented to him in a vision, in a dream uh, beforehand. And then you say, and people hear of it and are impressed and follow him. So the process by which a large uh, part of the Jewish population are made aware of uh, Nathan of Gaza's uh, proclamation of Shabtai Tzvi or recognition of Shabtai Tzvi as a messiah. It's because of these new uh, technologies of print and because of this new reading public uh, within uh, the Jewish communities that the news spreads so fastly and uh, attracts uh, yes. eventually so many followers. This is one possible uh, explanation. There are, there are others, other explanations such as that of uh, Gershom Sholem, the greatest uh, scholar of uh, Jewish mysticism, the founder of the academic study of Jewish mysticism in the 20th century, and the greatest scholar of uh, Shabbatai Tzvi, and he, he wrote the, the seminal work, Shabbatai, Shabbatai Tzvi. And uh, he, the, Sholem devotes the beginning of this book to a description of Lurianic Kabbalah, and to the concept of uh, tikkun, amendment. And he thinks that he, he connects it to the expulsion from Spain. And he, think, and he thinks that this is the reason that the um, messianic movement of Shabtai Tzvi was the first to be extremely popular. This is another explanation. That, that the, Can, the Jewish communities were culturally receptive to a messiah because of the great influence of Nurianic Kabbalah. That's, that's, his, uh, that's his idea. Um, that might be so, and but what I um, mentioned about communication it doesn't con- necessarily contradict, but it's uh, also an important uh, background. Um, we don't have to go into details whether um, how spread was Luriana Kabbalah and what did people know about it, but this is um, in, in the history of the study of Sabbatianism, it's an important. Uh, it's an important uh, notion. Maybe let me say something uh, in brackets before we go Please. to the to the story. If we think about uh, messianism, the appearing of, of a messiah, we can think of four kind of uh, preconditions. One is the need to amend, the feeling that the world is not going on properly, and uh, we need a strong amendation. We need a, a, a really a meaningful correction of the uh, of the world. Uh, the second factor is an ideology that explains that that gives the reference to a figure because correction can be in many ways. It can be in social, not necessarily it can be in social ways. Not necessarily one person being themselves, but so we need an, a, a base of messianic messianic ideology, and we need we need a messianic center. In this case, it is uh, Shabtai Tzvi. And the, the last factor, and that, that is what was very special about uh, the Sabbatian Messianism, we need a Messianic circle. Messianic circle is those who believe the Messiah and act according to this uh, belief. And the Messianic circle of uh, Shabtai Tzvi was larger than all previous Messianic uh, attempt in uh, Jewish, uh, so in Jewish culture. You, w- what you're saying, Professor Malvo, is that the conditions uh, within which it would make sense for a Messiah, fallen or otherwise, to arise is first a sense that we are living in a catastrophe, in a crisis. There's a great need for tikkun, for amendment, for correction. Two, there's an ideology. You know, there's the ideology and the ideas, the conceptualization of uh, amendment through the figure of a messiah, which it obviously is something that is present in Jewish culture, yeah. but not necessarily in all other cultures. Uh, three, you need a messianic figure on which the attention that is willing to take up the mantle, and here 
we have Shabtai Tzvi, and finally, of course, you need a circle of people that are willing to put their faith in that set yes. figure. And you had all of these conditions uh, yes. available and ripe yeah. for his coming. Now, coming back to uh, Shabtai Tzvi, maybe just I'll show you three printed objects. Please. The first one is this broadsheet. We couldn't bring... The original is here in the National Library, but here we, we use picture from the beautiful book, 101 Treasures. This is uh, Dutch, I think. Yes, that is, uh, that is a Dutch account of uh, Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, Shabtai Tzvi, and, the, and that's a picture of Shabtai Tzvi and of uh, Nathan Azati, I suppose, the imaginary it picture. It says, uh, Afbeelding van de Schirin, the Nieuwen Jotzen Koning. Yes. A picture yes. of the new Jewish king. And his prophet. Yes. And his prophet, and yes. His, uh, uh, Met zen bei hebend prophet. And uh, this is an example of the way news spread, for, for one thing. And for, for the other thing, it's an example of the interest that this story arose all around Europe, because the Jewish Messiah is, of course, relevant Sorry. for the Muslims and for the Christians, not only for the Jews. Um, this is, I mean, this is from Amsterdam, 1666. Yes, before, be, uh, before the crisis of this Messiah that we will, um, that I will tell you about soon. And uh, I'll show you another uh, book, uh, this book, small, small book. On the right, you can see the ex libris of Gershom Shalom, who collected um, all books of Jewish mysticism, and his wonderful library is here at the National Library. He donated it after his death to the National Library. We, we have the Gershom Shalom reading room with this uh, collection, including rare books. And this is a tikkun, a co literally correction, and correcting for Jews is reciting texts. And uh, so texts recite uh, at midnight, at certain times of the day, certain times of the month. In the front page of this uh, tikkun, it says the year of the Savior, Shnat mm -hmm. the It's uh, That's the combination of the events here. That's also in Amsterdam. Yes, that's in, uh, you see, Shnat Moshiach, the year of the Savior. Yes. This is what they use, because they use words for... Um, the numerical value, and that's what they did. And I, I have also another tikkun uh, of this uh, this uh, kind, again with uh, ex uh, ex libris, again with the year Moshia, year of the year of the, the Savior. You should. It's a rare book. You should treat it very gently, very careful. That uh, and touch only around it, not the. And you, and, but when you gently skim through it, you can see that it has texts of uh, prayers and uh, psalms and uh, to be recited during various uh, days. So this is something that works for the masses as well. We had with Natan of Gaza, we had the... Uh, deep and complicated Kabbalistic explanations of the situation, as well as with other learned uh, rabbis. And it certainly made an impression also on simple people. But what simple people can relate to is the, rit the basic rituals that are now connected to uh, Shabtai Tzvi. And these are mostly not, although there were also s some strange uh, Rituals, as I mentioned, not fasting on Tisha B'Av, also transgressing some uh, um, laws of uh, food. But, uh, I mean, there's nothing you can say against reading prayers and texts and, and psalms. Uh, so it, it combines very well with what we know what be of was uh, before, but it gives a new a way of um, taking part in, in the Jewish uh, religiosity and spirituality for, uh, 
for the for the masses. Besides uh, these uh, kind of uh, announcements of the new Jewish prophet with the meeting the new Jewish king, uh, the year of our salvation uh, printed in these prayer books, uh, did you also have um, resistance towards the idea of yes. him being the Messiah being printed also for the masses? Some people, some people were suspicious. At the first stages, there are less uh, printed uh, rejections. There's a, except I, I brought you the printed uh, material. There's a lot of letters and writings, an exchange of uh, an exchange of letters, and uh, some some people were more some rabbis were suspicious. Sometimes it, it really caused the threat to their lives because the masses were re really upset that they do not ex um, um, accept the the Messiah. So people but really wanted it to be true. Yes, needed people it to needed be true. it. Some people so, be, sold their possessions to be able to to join to the, to come to Palestine with uh, and uh, to Israel. And uh, there was this uh, really great expectation and excitement building. And uh, the Muslims also felt this. And I mean, politically, it's not. It can be dangerous. Um, so what happened was that in uh, 6066, um, Shabtai Tzvi was made uh, an offer by the um, Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan, that either he um, becomes Muslim or he dies. And uh, Surprisingly, for a uh, supposed uh, Jewish Messiah, he chose to stay alive and become Muslim. Become a Muslim. And this is really a sign of total, almost total disappointment. Jewish Messiahs can do many things and can change, can t change things, they have power, but this, maybe that's the one thing they cannot do. Convert. They cannot convert. But and so this, that con means this that conversion was for most people, not, not for all of them, but for most, for most people, that was the proof that this uh, Messiah is fallen. It, it is not, he wasn't, uh, either he wasn't real or he wasn't uh, successful, or this, this attempt is only imaginary and not uh, it's not true so this great disappointment yes. uh, happens only a year after the yes, a little meeting more, with yeah, uh, a little more than of a, Gaza a little more than a year so, but uh, so yeah, that, quite that would mean that, that already people were following him already for a while when he met Nathan of Gaza right no he was he was small scale it became so it, it was. It, it was, was only it, one year, roughly a little, speaking. A little more, than, more than one. Yeah, the, the more than one year. It was. Yeah, more. It's, it's about a year and a half. But uh, that, which is uh, a rather short period of time, I, I would yes, think. Yes, but you can. It's a short. A lot can happen in a year. A lot can happen. Yeah, a lot can happen in a day. And so, so before we go, before I, I would like to ask you some yeah. more about that great disappointment and his conversion. But during that year, year and a half between yeah. the time he meets. Uh, Nathan of Gadao declares him to be the Messiah until the time that he converts to Islam. How does he deal with his uh, messianic uh, 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 role? Uh, how does he gather the masses? What are his yeah. plans? He, me he meets people. People come to speak to him and to try to understand what is the to, gr to grasp the situation. Some are impressed and some are disappointed. Rabbis come, the missionaries come. I mentioned that he was uh, moody. Maybe th there is a claim that he was even kind of bipolar. Right. So during some of this, uh, either he was very excited, but sometimes he was also depressed and felt less, uh, less confident. And it, it changed some, he had better days and uh, and he stays it, it, in uh, the Holy Land uh, for the whole while. He travels no. back through Turkey. No, he's in Turkey. He's, I mean, in the, in the Ottoman uh, Empire. Yeah. What the, is the, now the, Turkey. Yeah. 
actually is afterwards, after being, uh, uh, after the conversion, when uh, the Ottoman authorities see that some people do stay with him, he's been exiled and he dies um, 10 years later in uh, Montenegro. So now when there's a disappointment of such an of such a great hope, some people, some people accept it, say we were wrong. We were wrong, but some people say no. This is um, actually it's a continuation of the mysterious plane of uh, God. This is the way to capture Islam. This is all. It will be. It should be changed later. And th there are also after he converts, there's a small group of uh, believers who um, quite immediately understand that they, they have to hide this uh, belief in uh, Shabtai Tzvi. That's from the believing in the Messiah point. But there's also... A small group of followers, who, not, not those that converted with him to some converted, Islam. Some converted with him but kept the connection with Judaism. Some were Jewish but believed his, in his Messiah. But there is something uh, else going on which is more complicated. I mentioned that there were two aspects of the Sabbatian uh, Messianism. One was theoretical with uh, explaining, explaining how the situation um, is according to the principles of uh, Kabbalah and to the and how and to the, and, and how it reflects the passage in the Zohar and things like that. And the other one was the active uh, popular one. Now, what happens afterwards is that you can be a Sabbatian without Shabbatai Tzvi if you believe or if you adhere to this uh, theoretical, very complicated uh, Kabbalistic uh, theories connected with, uh, with uh, for, with, for example, with uh, Natan from Gaza, from his, for his Kabbalistic writings, um, and then with other uh, figures who followed this uh, theory. So there is um, also a kind of, we can say, a theoretical Sabbatianism. Now, this causes a real uh, suspicion in the Jewish world and a feeling that uh, we cannot know the, tr the truth about uh, people. People might be hiding their true, might be hiding their true belief. In this period, for example, we have the um, idea that uh, before death, the devil is trying to tempt the dying person to denounce Judaism. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, actions take, take, um, taken against these uh, temptations. But what stands behind this uh, idea of the temptation of the devil before death, especially in the spirit, is this notion that actually we cannot know exactly who the people are, what do they secretly believe in, and since the time of death is a time of truth, and that's where you take off the masks, you say what is important for you, in, in, in really what is really important for you, then you might, one might find out that actually what you thought about this rabbi or this person, or even maybe about yourself, was, uh, was, was, was wrong, was not the, the reality. And we have also, so like we have an attempt of, of attempts to, to find out, we have accusations also of important rabbis saying that uh, they're uh, closeted uh, Shabbatians. Yes. And, uh, and later, and w when there's further on, when there, there's uh, all kind of uh, uh, messianic attempts, even very pious, such as, for example, of uh, Ramchal, people are getting very tensed about it and immediately they demand to, to stop it. They, then they, they feel you can say there's a feeling of nervousness toward any messianic uh, attempt. What do we know, Professor Avril Barlevav, about 
his final years, about the time where he himself converted. We know that he was moody, maybe bipolar. Uh, what do, how did he, how did this man who had, I guess, a fragile uh, stability, a mental stability, a psychological stability, yeah. how did he deal with his own conversion, with his status as now what seems to be uh, mainly perceived as a fallen messiah, if not a false messiah? How did he survive? He was mostly sad. He had uh, also followers coming, and that's why he was uh, exiled. And uh, he was uh, in a kind, a kind of prison or seclusion, and uh, they, the Ottoman authorities tried to lower the fire and not to, to enable. He never, he never reclaimed his messianic position. He never tried to regain his uh, messianic fate. I think he believed this was. A temporary. Um, he, he did that. That that, 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 that this was a temporary event. He also he never he never left it. He never said, "Well, it didn't." He didn't say, "Well, it didn't succeed." Let's go on. He did believe in his a special way. He tried to justify his conversion to to Islam, to say that this is the the way of the the true way of the Lord of uh, Israel. Mm. And that's... Uh, um, you know, in this series of conversation, uh, Professor bar we're trying to think and reflect about uh, the foundational role of crisis, the way in which uh, various crises of Jewish history shaped uh, the Jewish culture and the Jewish identity that we know today. What would you think are the main cultural, uh, religious, uh, or other repercussions of this crisis of the crisis yes. of the fall of uh, the Shabbat uh, Tzvi, the fall of this yes. uh, king of the Jews? It goes in two, maybe opposite ways. One is the, everything, it's, it's a great shock. And in a way, everything moves, everything change, changes. There's a new look on the beliefs um, that were before, but from the other end, and this is uh, also very interesting, there is also a very natural and strong overcome. I mean, with the religious messianic movement could have been destroyed by such, uh, such an event. For example, the followers might have also become a Muslim or Jews who could have thought that uh, it shows that the religion is wrong and having a great crisis. And what is interesting, we can see here the, really the liveliness of the Jewish culture and the strength. We had this great shock. We, we had this great disappointment. We, um, we understand um, it's not, this is not the time of the real Messiah, but we continue. We continue with our rituals, with our life. Now, what happened afterwards in uh, not only in, in, in European culture, um, Enlightenment and uh, then modernism and secularism, it happened afterwards. And we can try to think other connections between this kind of uh, failure of a religious movement and what happened afterwards. Um, Gershom Sholem, in a famous essay, tried to connect actually uh, the Sabbatian movement and the Sabbatian fall with what would afterwards become modernity, saying that this is a new dialectic approach and uh, it's a new organization of, uh, of reality. What impresses me most is the way things continued. Although all this noise and all this, all this uh, disappointment, still Jewish religious traditional life uh, continued, was shaped in a new way. There's, uh, there's Hasidism, later on there's Orthodoxy, there's um, also Jewish uh, secularization, which is part of Jewish culture as well. It could, that, I mean, this is a great shock. And then, as I said, 
we continue. It's interesting because we in one of the episodes we we categorized the very notion of crisis from the Greek yes. krinian to yes. divide to distinguish yes. like a critic that divides yes. or distinguishes good movies from bad movies. Yes. The crisis uh, distinguishes two eras: is yes. before Sapnianism and after Sapnianism. And in a sense, what you're saying is that it might not be that much of a crisis, given that it was perhaps more of a disturbance. In the end, you seem to be saying that uh, pre Shabtai uh, Tzvi Judaism and post Shabtaism uh, uh, Judaism weren't all that uh, essentially uh, different. The effect that this adventure had might not have been as dramatic as uh, it is sometimes portrayed to be. Yeah, it depends. There, there are various views of this. Um, Sholem, for example, thought that actually 1666 is the end of Jewish medieval period. Mm. But I think um, that maybe that actually end of medieval times is print. The print made the, the change. It's a matter of perspective. I wouldn't say, I mean, it, it is, I mean, it's, it's a great event. As I said from the, in the, in the, as I said in the beginning, it was a world event before, as b before print, when there was a messiah in Yemen or in uh, Spain, he was local. Now it's a kind of a global messiah, at least Europe, global, Ottoman and European uh, in, 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 uh, messiah. And uh, there was an attempt to also to cover it. People felt embarrassed about what to happened. To repress that history. Yes. People felt embarrassed. People suppress. didn't suppress. People um, burnt, burnt their letters of uh, appreciation and, and uh, trying not to talk too much uh, about it, uh, not to tell how it was. But still, again, I think that's a part of this because it was in the 17th century, as Sholem notes, there's no messianic figure in Jewish culture that, that we know so much of as we know on Shabtai, Shabtai Tzvi. I have somewhat of a wider question, Professor Baudelvav. The messianic ideal, the uh, yearning for the Messiah is something that accompanies Jewish culture, you know, uh, obviously in the Old Testament, uh, the books of the prophets, uh, the most famous of Jewish messiahs, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, we talked about uh, Sabbatianism. There are some messianic impulses in uh, some, at least, uh, Jewish movements today, uh, 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 the Lubavitch uh, rabbi, and, uh, yes. rabbi and the Lubavitch uh, Hasidut. Um, and there's also uh, messianic, uh, messianics has be also become a term uh, to which to designate aspects of yes. uh, current uh, uh, right-wing uh, Israeli yes. religious uh, politics. Yes. Um, what do you think, uh, do you think that throughout the ages uh, that that messianic ideal uh, has you know some significant common uh, ground and what do you think its uh, significance cultural religious uh, is today for uh, Jewish and Israeli culture yes I think that there's a difference between the messianic idea and the messiah there is something very uplifting in the messianic idea in the sense that it shows the way to a better world to a more just and uh, peaceful uh, mm. world but um, already the sages in uh, Sanhedrin they debated will the redemption be gradual or will it be sudden and uh, the figure of the messiah is uh, of, of course sudden it's uh, and uh, so th it's a different uh, story than the general idea of uh, of correction the idea of correction i think is very important and uh, but the question is whether this uh, correction is a gradual practical process or do we wait for something divine to for something divine to, to happen intervene. and to change the world and to act in reality in a supernatural way 
And, and that, again, coming back to Gershon Shalem, he warned from this uh, idea of uh, messianism that uh, contradicts reality and uh, wants to, that wants to change reality in a dangerous, in a da dangerous way. But I would like to say also something different about messianism that we didn't talk about. We talked about political messianism, but there's also personal messianism. In Jewish uh, culture, there are also mystical messiahs who um, concentrate in themselves. Um, that was shown in the work of my teacher, uh, Moshe Idel, especially about uh, Avraham, uh, Avraham Abulafia. And this is also an important uh, aspect of uh, Jewish uh, culture, the messianism in, as kind of a process of uh, self-correction, uh, self self-development, uh, connection with the, with the divine. Do you think we have a quasi-Sabbatean uh, crisis brewing in Israel uh, today? Well, I'm not, I'm not a prophet. <laughs> um, no, I don't think. I think it's more, it's quasi, if it's quasi, I don't think so. If it's quasi Sabbatism, it's more in the sense of uh, minor groups thinking crazy ideas. But maybe this is coming back to what I said about the Sabbatean crisis. The, there's a combination, I think, in the process of uh, Jewish, uh, of the development of Jewish culture between lightness and heaviness. And the lightness is the way, is the flexibility and the way to ex um, accept new ideas and uh, new directions. But also there is something heavy in the, that, that keeps continuing. Mm. And uh, I think this may be the protection of quasi, from quasi Sabbatianism. Thank you, Professor Berlevin, for a wonderful uh, conversation. Thank and thank you so much for joining us here and sharing of your wisdom, your research, uh, your knowledge with such generosity and in such a great spirit. And thank you very much uh, to our holy audience. I very much hope you enjoyed uh, this episode of Asimchas uh, in our series of conversation on the significance of Jewish crisis in Jewish history. I very much hope you enjoyed our previous episodes. I very much hope you enjoyed the conversations we hope to be having in the future. And in the meantime, I hope there's not too much of a crisis going on in your life at the moment. Only good health, Zeigesund, good news, of Simchus, and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.